For Game of Thrones, the card game second edition, we are going to be looking at the Lannisters. This is my personal favorite <clears throat> family in the for personal favorite house in Game of Thrones, so I want to take a look at them. And what we'll do will be pretty simple. We will read through the article, take a look at the cards, and see what's going on. Uh, here they just basic overview of the card game. Um, this again, how uh, this talks about in the Game of Thrones, the card game, the Lannisters are devious, manipulative, and indirect. They are ambush specialists, they play the intrigue game aggressively, and they are extremely wealthy. Figuratively, they are monsters. They are not averse to using torture and intimidation to achieve their goals, and this faction is the home of a number of characters who can be quite frightening when they hit the board. There's also a chaotic aspect to this faction. The Lannisters deal with a fair number of wild cards and unpredictable entities on their path to the Iron Throne, and being able to make the resultant chaos work in your favor is an important skill for leading this faction. Uh, I've got a couple cards you can see here. Tyrion, who I, I want to note, they've definitely, well, they, the card game is based off the books, not the TV show. You can definitely see the influence of the TV show here. If, you, if you've seen any of the old Tyrion Lannister cards from first edition, he was a pig-nosed, freakish monstrosity kind of guy, which is how he's described in the books. This is a, a dinklaged Tyrion Lannister. Um, so we move on. As a loyal member of House Lannister, you're no stranger to lies, deception, and trickery. Skullduggery may not be pleasant, but it's the key to getting ahead in the Game of Thrones. After all, those who hold too closely to ideals often end up dead. In a Game of Thrones the card game, these tactics are most closely related to intrigue challenges, so it's no surprise that the Lannisters would excel where intrigue is concerned. In fact, House Lannister features several cards that drastically increase the power of your intrigue challenges, beginning with Cersei Lannister. Card 84 from the core set. So you see she costs 4 gold to put out. She has the intrigue and power icons, and an overall strength of 4. Her name is Cersei Lannister. She has the Lady Queen traits. And the special ability, while Cersei Lannister is attacking during an intrigue challenge, raise the claim value on your revealed plot card by one. That's pretty devastating. So even if you play a plot card that has a claim of zero, with Cersei you can still knock a card out of somebody's hand. Play a plot card that has a um, claim of two, you're knocking three cards out of their hand. Out of a hand of maybe five or six cards anyway. So, excuse me, that's pretty devastating. Uh, my only comment on the card, I don't care for the art. There, there's some art from the first edition of the game that I think is fantastic. In fact, my playmat is, car, is Cersei card art from the first edition, and I just don't think it compares. This doesn't compare to that art. Um, other than that, I think she's a nice, manageable four. Um, she'll hold her own mostly, I'm sure, against most other intrigue characters. And if you team her with somebody else, uh, she's probably going to be unstoppable. Uh, so, they say, Cersei Lannister can make your intrigues much more dangerous than they would be otherwise. She can participate in intrigue or power challenges, but her specialty is attacking during an intrigue challenge. In this situation, her ability raises the claim value on your revealed plot card by one, stripping more cards from your opponent's hand and reducing his options for coming rounds. Uh, then they show us here Casterly Rock and Lannisport. Uh, Casterly Rock costs two to put out. It is a stronghold in the Westerlands, for keywords. Uh, you may in initiate an additional intrigue challenge during the challenge phase. I uh, can be pretty brutal if you find a way to keep Cersei untapped, uh, or have multiple characters with the intrigue keyword, which I'm sure the Lannisters have plenty of. Uh, then they have Lannisport. Costs three gold to put out. The Westerlands keyword. Reaction. After you win an intrigue challenge, draw one card. Again, works really well for the Lannister theme. Um, so, those three cards have me pretty excited so far. Of course, when you specialize in intrigue challenges, you'll want to make you want to make as many as possible. Under normal circumstances, you're limited to one challenge of each type per challenge phase. Fortunately, you can increase this number with Casterly Rock. 
which we just looked at. While you hold this location, you may initiate an additional intrigue challenge during the challenge phase, giving you more opportunities to tear apart your opponent's hand and reap the benefits. Casterly Rock is impressive enough on its own, but you can also take advantage of the bustling trade business that flows through Lannisport, which we also just looked at. Whenever you win an intrigue challenge with Lannisport in play, you may draw one card. Drawing additional cards is crucial to victory in a Game of Thrones the card game, and Lannisport gives you a consistent way to draw more cards. Best of all, this ability is not, is not conditional to entry challenges in which you attack, so even if you successfully defended an entry challenge, you can draw a card with Lannisport. Now the only thing, some of the verbiage here um, struck me, because it says here, Whenever you win an entry challenge with Lannisport in play, so you need to have it in play, but with Casterly Rock, it says while you hold this location. That might say to me while you're holding it in your hand, but I'm assuming it also means while it's in play. Um, one thing I'm noticing, okay, it does say location. So these both say location, and we can see here what Tyrion says character. So I'm assuming when you have it in play. It doesn't make any sense otherwise. It's just the verbiage. It's one of my pet peeves with Fantasy Flight games. They flip-flop between verbiage, and they don't seem to understand or care that when you're talking about specific rules, that can be confusing. Uh, but it also might just be that you had to be so specific in the first edition of this game that such verbiage really mattered. Um, I might just be being nitpicky at this point. Alright, so moving on, you can make a little money from the Lannister proclivity for intrigues with the help of Tyrion Lannister. So he is a character, costs five gold to put out, has the intrigue and power icons, four strength, just like Cersei, Tyrion Lannister name, Lord keyword, he has stealth, and a reaction, after an intrigue challenge is initiated, gain two gold. Ooh, very nice. Tyrion Lannister bears the, the stealth keyword, which enables him to sneak past your opponent's defenders. When you attack with a character that has stealth, you may choose one of your opponent's characters that does not have stealth. The chosen character cannot defend against the challenge, allowing you to slip past and perpetrate your schemes. Stealth isn't Tyrion's only attribute, though. Whenever you, any player initiates an entry challenge, you may gain two gold if you have Tyrion in play. I didn't catch that at first. After an entry challenge is initiated, not just by you or against you, just period. And in my game, uh, we play with four people, so that's potentially eight gold a turn. Um, now, if you go first in the turn order, it might not make a difference, because the taxation is going to drain it all from you anyway, but still. Um, gaining gold during the challenge phase may not seem extremely useful. Uh, as I just said, you're probably going to have it drained in the taxation phase anyway, but if you go later in the challenges, it may be able to fuel some reactionary cards. Uh, continuing on with their paragraph, after all, you can only play characters, locations, and attachments during the marshalling phase, which has already occurred. However, many events have a gold cost that you can pay with Tyrion's gold. In addition, the Lannisters are masters of the ambush keyword. Some cards, such as the Birdman, which I'll look at in just a moment, bear the ambush keyword. By playing a card's ambush cost, you may put it into play during the challenge phase. After you gain gold from Tyrion's reaction, you may surprise your opponent by suddenly playing the Burned Men to attack or defend in a military challenge. So the Burned Men, cost two, have the Warfare icon, two overall strength, called the Burned Men, Clansmen, Ambush two, you may pay two gold to put this card into play from your hand during the challenges phase. So that's exciting. Put your gold to work. Hiring mercenaries and playing events aren't the only ways you can use your gold when you play as House Lannister. In fact, you don't even need to spend your gold to increase the power of Tywin Lannister. Tywin Lannister would be a formidable force without any ability. He boasts all three challenge icons and six strength. But a lord of House Lannister should do more, and Tywin Lannister certainly delivers on this promise. He bears the renown keyword, allowing him to claim a power when he wins a challenge and he adds two gold to your total income granted on your plot card. So this is him here. Seven gold to put out. All three challenge icons and six strength. So he's a truck. Uh, Tywin Lannister, Lord Keyword, Renown, and Tywin Lannister gets plus one strength for each gold in your pool. 
So just on his ability alone, he's an eight, as long as, until you spend it. Uh, with so much gold at your disposal, you almost certainly leave some unspent. Tywin Lannister makes makes your unspent gold work for you by gaining an additional strength for each gold in your gold pool. It doesn't take much gold to turn Tywin into a veritable titan, easily capable of winning a challenge without assistance. Then, your unspent gold adds to your total strength in the dominance phase, increasing your odds uh, increasing your odds of getting additional power and claiming the Iron Throne. So, team him with Tyrant Tyrion. Go, if you go later in the round, uh, have Tyrion gain four, six gold during the challenge phase. Uh, suddenly he's a 12. Uh, do whatever you want at that point. Uh, of course, House Lannister's riches can also support their back alley deals and intrigues. You never know when you may need to buy the service of a spy, a mercenary company, or a similar rogue. One such character who can help you destroy your opponents is the Queen's Assassin. When you ambush the Queen's Assassin into play, you can choose an opponent. If that opponent has less cards in hand than you, he must choose and kill a character he controls. If you've been making, uh, if you've been making drawing on the full power of Lannister's intrigues, let me read that again. If you've been making drawing on the full power of Lannister's intrigues, you should have no problem forcing your opponent to have less cards in hand than you. For the right price, the Queen's Assassin gives you an easy way to kill your opponent's characters. So let's see. Queen's Assassin, two gold. The intrigue icon, two overall strength. Queen's Assassin for a name, spy keyword, ambush four. So you can just pop him out in the challenge phase for four gold. Reaction. After the Queen's Assassin enters play using Ambush, choose an opponent. If you have more cards in hand than that player, he or she must choose and kill a character he or she controls. Yep, so that's pretty brutal. Especially in a house that doesn't seem like it's going to be tremendously strong in the Warfront. Uh, then we, we skip this one because I thought... Oh, they, they mentioned it down here. All right. You'll find another tool to rid yourself of bothersome characters in The Things I Do for Love. This, uh, this event can only be played if you control a Lannister Lord or Lady character, and it allows you to kneel your faction card and pay a character's printed cost to return it to its owner's hand. Because you played the Things I Do for Love as an action, you can use it to suddenly remove an attacker or defender, giving any challenge in your favor. Naturally, it's expensive to remove a high-cost character like Rob Stark from the core set, number 40, 146, but if anybody has the money to accomplish this task, this task it's the Lannisters. So it's an event with X cost, play only if you control a Lannister Lord or Lady, challenges action, kneel your faction card to choose a character with the printed cost of X or lower controlled by that opponent and return it to its owner's hand. And then, just because they have it listed in here, a Lannister, a start card, cost six to put out, uh, strength, uh, Warfare, and Power Icons, 5 Strength, Rob Stark, the Lord keyword, he has Renown, and Reaction. After a Stark character you control is sacrificed or killed, stand each character you control. Oh, well, I'm not going to like that very much. And Hear Me Roar. When you fight for House Lannister, there are games within games and wheels within wheels. Your coffers overflow with gold, and you're willing to pay any price to destroy your opponents. Whether you stand brazenly on the tourney ground or skulk in the shadows, the Lannisters can claim, power, can claim the power they need to win the Game of Thrones. House Lannisters' untold wealth and cunning deception. Uh, cunning deceptions may be your path to the Iron Throne, but some factions seek to influence the Iron Throne for, more, for far nobler reasons than mere power. And then next week they go on the Night's Watch section. So that'll probably be who I do next. I'll do a video on the Night's Watch, because I think they look like they're going to be pretty neat, too. Um, but going back over the Lannisters real quick, uh, we didn't get to see this Treachery card. Let's go through the cards. Maybe they had some in here that they didn't show in the article. So I see Lannister. Casterly Rock, Lannisport, Tyrion, Burnman, Tywin, the Queen's Assassin, things I do for Love Rob's talking about. I'm very excited. Uh, like I said, they are my favorite house. Um, in the first edition, they had a lot of being powerful in intrigue and kneeling your characters. There was a version of Cersei that could turn the game into solitaire if you weren't careful, or if you were uh, mean-spirited enough. It, it ruined a lot of games, actually, the control that Cersei could get. 
Um, I think I think some of the people in my gaming group were plotting ways to steal her and burn the physical card itself. I think this is a lot more focused. Uh, gold to pay for stuff and power in the intrigue challenges. Uh, you have um, Titan potentially in Tywin. That's phenomenal. And a lot of trickery. I like Lannister trickery. Uh, so it was this preview that got me excited. Because I saw that it looked, they looked balanced, they looked focused, and they looked interesting. And I liked the card theme. The cards, if you look at the Lannister cards, feel like they belong to House Lannister. And if you look at the Stark card, I think it feels like it belongs in House Stark. Um, so yeah, no, I'm I'm very excited. Uh, the game, I think, comes out tomorrow at Gen Con, so that's even more exciting. And uh, I will do a bit, another video soon previewing the Night's Watch.